Howdy, I'm Tom Church. I'm a policy fellow at the Hoover Institution. And today I'm trying to figure out what American voters know about federal policies, especially the federal budget. And to do that, I'm talking with Michael Boskin. Michael, thanks for chatting with me today. My pleasure, Tom. Michael, you have a lot of titles. So here at Hoover, you are the Wolford Family Senior Fellow. You were the Chairman of Economic Advisors for H.W. Bush. And more recently, you've taken over as director of the Tenenbaum Program for Fact-Based Policy here at the Hoover Institution. So let's actually start there. What is the Tenenbaum Program for Fact-Based Policy? The Tenenbaum Program for Fact-Based Policy is an exciting new program for the Hoover Institution. We're bringing together experts both at Hoover and around the country, people who come from different policy perspectives, Democrats, Republicans, independents, people who have served in administrations of different uh, political stripe to bring together, to, to survey what people need to know about various policy issues to make informed choices as voters and as citizens. That involves getting people that are highly respected, that are not extremely political in their views and try to foist us particular talking points on anybody, but actually get to what the substance is of the basic problems and issues and how to resolve them. So they write about what is the factual information that we know that should form at least one major input into decisions about these programs? Number two, what, what's the context for those facts? And number three, why they sometimes may come to different conclusions. But in that way, voters can reason their way through this and try to cut through all the misinformation and highly politicized disinformation let alone on social, social media and what's coming on AI, to try to get at what really is useful factual knowledge and information upon which they can base informed decisions. There are a lot of topics you could be talking about. I know you did a couple surveys with Doug Rivers of YouGov and of the Hoover Institution. So tell me what you surveyed American voters about. Well, Doug Rivers and I decided the first thing we should do is figure out, number one, what people knew about various subjects. Number two, what they thought they knew. It could be incorrect. Number three, what they thought they needed to know more about. And number four, what they thought other people might need to know more about. In a sense, trying to find, narrow in and find a a basically a set of things that it would be really valuable to provide this type of fact-based information upon which to base decisions, or at least to inform voters more generally. And after we have these basic papers, we're narrowing that down to shorter pieces and then short videos. We'll have a short uh, just the facts uh, basic type of analysis, which will lay out some key facts that people know, need to know about all these things without embellishing them with any opinion. So that's very exciting for us. But I have to tell you that uh, distinguishing those things is not easy. And nobody's ever asked before what voters uh, think other people need to know more about or even what they think to know more about. A lot of polls look at what are the top issues on your mind as you face the next election. And that may be important issues to people. They may either know a lot about it or think they know a lot about it and aren't really open to any new information. So we don't want to waste our time and energy trying to convince people that already have made up their mind, that have no, no sense that there may be other information that would be useful to them, et cetera. But the exciting thing about the results was in serving 2,000-plus American voters weighted to reflect the general population of the United States, it really was exciting to see that most people would admit they need to know more about most, most of these things. And many of them, actually a large fraction of them, admitted they don't know very much about it. Uh, some, are, some say they know a fair amount. Some say they know enough. Some say... They're well-informed, but uh, a large majority on most of the issues say they need to know more. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out if people are well-informed, uninformed, or misinformed. Well, I'd say the first and third categories, uh, well-informed and misinformed, are small minorities of the population, and uh, lacking information is by far the most prevalent thing that comes out of this, including both a large fraction of the population saying they need to know more. And remember, we're talking about the public policy aspects of these. So some people know about their own taxes, but need to know more of that tax code for public policy purposes. Some people are on Social Security and know a lot about how it affects them, but they need to know more about it. For example, that 
Social Security's trustees say that Social Security will run out of funds to make full benefit payments uh, within a decade. So that's the sort of thing we're trying to get at. And people will admit that they have lots they need to know more about and seem to be open and willing to embrace f uh, reliable, factual information. You know, when it comes to Social Security and I talk to younger voters, I point out that they don't need to think about it only when they're 65 or 67. They're paying for it as soon as they start working and pay payroll taxes. You've got to think about the financial status of the system now. Well, absolutely. And there's going to be a big public policy debate. Unfortunately, if it happened when it should have happened years or decades ago, it would have been a much smoother transition. But now that we get are getting closer and closer to this iceberg about uh, we couldn't make full payments and the way the law is written, Social Security can't send out benefit checks for money they don't have. They have to pay it out of the trust fund. So with that in mind, there's going to be a big political battle over what to do about it, and there are various options, but it's important people have the basic facts. Uh, this program does some great good. It uh, is the best anti-poverty program we have. It's helped reduce poverty among the elderly way below the general population when it used to be way above it. But also it has very, very high costs. It was set up at a time when we had very different economic needs and uh, demographic situations. When it was set up, there were 16 workers per retiree. Now we're under three heading to two. And some of the more, other more advanced economies in Western Europe, for example, Japan, China eventually are heading to even lower than, than we are. All right, let's turn to the survey and results from American voters. So the first question you asked about was, has the national debt increased as a percentage of GDP? So what were the results? How did American voters do? Well, distressingly, only uh, slightly under half the population knew the federal budget was in deficit. Maybe a small handful of times in decades has it ever run a balanced budget or a surplus, the last time being, I think, 1999. So, so it's been a long time, and people should know this, and of course it's discussed all the time. It's been the subject of some big reforms and big ba battles in Washington, uh, there was a big sequester fight in 2011. There, there will be another big battle coming up. There's every once in a while there's a battle over raising the debt ceiling without getting some spending control. So it's been in the news, but uh, you know not everybody's paying attention, and uh, many people need to know more about it and what some of the options are for doing better and getting to a more fiscally sustainable path that's compatible with our values and uh, maintaining strong prosperity and economic growth. Another question you asked was, how much does the government spend as a percent of the economy? And this is kind of a hard question because you and I think about things in terms of percent of GDP, but I think most people listening in the news would hear five, six trillion dollars. So how did voters do on this question? Again, not very well. And I think pollsters historically, Doug is the chief scientist for YouGov. He's the super expert on this. I'm the economist. <laughs> But uh, and he's a great political scientist, but I think that the, uh, the story is that people are not as good when they have to make quantitative assessments rather than qualitative ones. That's number one. Uh, number two, most people don't think in terms of trillions of anything anytime. So it's not really easy to come up with a number like that when maybe the most you're thinking about is hundreds or thousands in your daily life, right? So it's, it's not an easy thing. But uh, adjusted for inflation, we have about a $27 trillion economy, and the federal government spends about $7 trillion. That's not – state and local governments also spend a lot of money. That's something we haven't polled yet, but others have and will probably do at a future time. And where does that leave us? So most people wouldn't, couldn't guess within a, a five percentage point band in either direction of what their recent spending had been. Of course, it had been swollen by COVID – and the very large expenditures. But even going back to the pre-COVID level, it was really, uh, really odd that some people were way, way, way off, had not much of an idea just of the, f of the percentage of the total size of the economy. Ballpark figure, maybe a little more than a fifth of the economy is spent by the federal government? Well, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more than that these days. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, but historically, historically, it's run around a fifth, and it's obviously gone up during wartime. It was... Um, almost half of GDP during World War II at the peak, uh, and we can go on and on, but it's, uh, you know, it's really, really 
um, fluctuated according to immediate needs, but also there's been a trend in recent times for there to be massive government spending, uh, at least some of it justifiable on a humanitarian basis. It's economists question how successful it was in stimulating the economy when the economy got in trouble, like in the financial crisis and Great Recession and the COVID uh, lockdowns where there are many people who are struggling who are involuntarily unemployed by the government forcing firms to shut down. People got laid off. One nice thing about serving American voters is that you can break things down by partisan ideology. So how did Republicans do versus Democrats when it comes to knowledge about the budget? Well, I think... Uh, for better or for worse, <laughs> Republicans seem to be a little more knowledgeable of things like the deficit and the national debt than Democrats. Um, and when we got to questions about what, which of the major programs have been growing most rapidly or most slowly, there was, a, there was an interesting partisan divide. And it wasn't so much Republicans versus Democrats. That was certainly true. But when you asked about programs that most people would think that Democrats tend to think are more important and that they want to see bigger, they were, they were believed, even though some of them were growing very rapid, like Social Security and Medicare, that they were growing slower than the rest of the budget. And uh, Republicans were the reverse. Uh, when things that they really liked, they thought were growing slower than the, uh, the rest of the budget. And when each people identifying in each party saw that uh, something was being asked, a program that they might, might not care as much about as the other party, as at least as caricatured or stereotyped to be. Obviously, there's a range of opinion in each of the parties. But it was really interesting because what happened was people thought the things they didn't like were growing more rapidly, and people think, thought the things that they did like in this simple, simple oversimplified caricature, uh, you know, things they did like were growing too slowly, things they didn't like were growing more rapidly than the rest of the budget. Yeah, that's a good thing I need to remember for myself. Look at the numbers. Don't go based on sentiment. Yeah, you know, look, uh, it's understandable that people have a very different view of the different programs. You know, if you're on Social Security and Medicare, you have a very different view than some people who are paying the taxes early in their career, and it's the biggest tax they pay. Um, and I can, you can go on and on about different uh, – There, if you, if you have family in the military, you have a different view – or if you, uh, you know, have lost somebody in recent years, have a history in World War II or Korea or Vietnam of uh, family and, the, and friends in the military, you have a different, pay more attention probably to what's going on in the military and the defense budget than people who are more removed. What are the actual biggest programs in the federal budget, top three or four? Well, it's, uh, it's changed a lot recently, but quite, for quite some time, Social Security has been the largest program. The second largest program inching out by a teeny, teeny bit is national defense. It, eke, it ekes out a very tiny uh, current advantage, soon to be displaced, by interest payments on the debt. And if we lumped all the health care programs together, Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, which is the, the children's insurance program, et cetera, they would add up to a big, a big piece too. Their, Medicare is perhaps going as rapidly as anything, maybe more rapidly than, than much of the rest, partly because of rising health care costs and partly because of the aging population. Michael, what do you think about this notion that's commonly held among American voters in the public that defense spending is really half the budget because mandatory spending is paid for, and so only discretionary spending is what we should be paying attention to? Well, Tom, let's, let's start with what those things mean. Manda So-called mandatory spending sometimes called entitlement spending, are items like Social Security and Medicare, which just go on and on. They have some rules, and they just keep going on and on as long as there's money. And it does, nothing happens to them that changes that unless Congress passes a new law and changes them. Uh, they have occasionally in the past. In 1983, they put in some reforms, some, uh, for example, gradually raising the retirement age in the distant future for full benefits. Um, and the like. Um, so those things are kind of on autopilot, and if more people show up and claim the benefits, they'll get them. Uh, on uh, the, and about one-third of the budget, to oversimplify and round easily understood numbers, uh, is called discretionary spending, which means the budgets for those things have to be annually appropriated every year. And there's about a dozen of those bills, and that's what has hung up in recent uh, Congresses has hung up passage of these things on time. 
And that has resulted in what's called continuing resolutions, which were designed to be very brief temporary stop gaps, but at times have lasted six months. Um, and they're designed just to keep spending, to approve, make it legal to spend at last year's level and continue that, appropriate those funds. And if you take that, again, roughly making a very simple division, the numbers aren't exactly this neat, it's about half defense and half non-defense. In 2011, 2010-2011, there was a big debate. President Obama appointed the Simpson-Bowles Commission. He appointed them. They came up with a bunch of reforms on entitlements and tax codes and things of that sort that would deal with the deficit and debt and make some, on balance, good reforms. Republicans held their nose about some tax things. Democrats held their nose about some entitlement reforms. But it looked like it was going to be very good. But President Obama decided not to go forward with that. He kind of, you know, maybe it's ungenerous, but he yanked the rug out from under the Simpson-Bowles Commission. And the, that was never put forward. And then they had uh, various negotiations between the Republicans Congress and, and President Obama. And eventually, uh, they decided on something called the sequester. This is a program where automatic cuts occur if something doesn't happen. And the idea was Republicans couldn't stand cuts in defense spending, and Democrats couldn't stand cuts in the other parts of the discretionary budget, education, the environment, a whole bunch of other, uh, other programs, transportation and the like. And <clears throat> so what happened? They were, supposed to not, they were supposed to force agreement to avoid the sequester, but they couldn't. So the sequester went into effect, and there were very large cuts. And they stay, uh, uh, yeah, cuts in inflation-adjusted spending were quite large. In defense spending, that half of discretionary spending in round numbers, was cut so substantially that compared to just adjusting the budget then for inflation up to now, there's a $2 trillion gap. Now, now of course, not all of that would affect current readiness. Some of it was you know, operating current expenses and so on. Uh, and we're, we're over $100 billion short of where we'd be then. We can argue about whether that's enough or not enough, and is it being well spent? And should the Pentagon be more efficient? Could Congress change how they micromanage the, the Pentagon to allow them to be more efficient? All those are legitimate arguments. But at the only times we've made any big progress have been with uh, you know people feeling their backs were against the wall. They had to pass something. Sometimes that's been draconian. But so far, they stayed away from the entitlement programs, which are running out of money. That is, um, uh, they're running down the trust funds, and Social Security and Medicare will both have problems in the not-too-distant future. And both for the people who are on those programs, not to scare them, for people who are going to retire in the the not-too-distant future, help them plan for the future— And because of the potential for an abrupt disruption of the economy by any huge change that's made, it would be better if we could agree on something sooner, smooth it in gradually, and and not have such an abrupt political confrontation over it. But the past has revealed that, uh, you know, the Congress and the administration on budget matters tend to work to deadlines and beyond the deadlines. I asked you about a lot of numbers. So where do you go to get your official statistics? How big the economy is? How big the deficit is? Well, the United States has a different uh, statistical system than the rest of the world, which tends to have a unified one, each country have one unified fiscal office, or is it somewhat decentralized? For information about the size of the economy, the gross, nas- uh, gross domestic product, the total value of, everything, of all the new goods and services produced in a year in the United States, uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis of the Commerce Department publishes something called the National Income Accounts. Now, I have to admit, I'm a professional economist, but I also slept through the lectures on national income accounting in my undergraduate days, and I'm sure some of the listeners and viewers uh, have too. But that's where you get information on that. Um, Three times a quarter, they publish information on the growth the previous quarter as more information comes along. And then, of course, when the year's over, they publish information about the entire year. And it's adjusted as the data improves, methods improve, et cetera. They also adjust it for inflation uh, in various ways. So, And you can get it on the components of gross domestic product and on the industry breakdown and whether it's consumer spending or in business investment or government purchases of goods and services or exports or imp- minus imports or whatever. So that's where that's from. On the budget, uh, historical data can be obtained from many places, 
But the Office of Management Budget, as part of the budget, publishes something called historical tables. And they tend to, you know, are data that's already occurred. And then they publish the president's uh, administration's projections for the coming few years. Those, of course, can be optimistic or pessimistic and include a lot of new spending that the president may propose or some changes in the tax code or whatever it happens to be. And there's data there both on for historical purposes and projections for the future, and projections are projections. I'll come back to an alternative source in a moment. Um, and those will have things like what were total outlays uh, spending by the federal government, total revenues, uh, the deficit or debt, the national debt at the end of the year, et cetera. And the national debt's the sum of all the previous deficits America's ever had, minus uh, the few surpluses we've had. So it's the net of all that. Um, and they'll also publish it by category. If you want defense spending, if you want transportation spending, they'll publish it by that. And even programs within those big agencies, they'll publish it by agency and by function. So you can get lots of information about that and much else, probably more than people on this uh, listening to this will need to know. An alternative source is the Congressional Budget Office, which makes its own projections, including what they think current law would be and what current policy would be. And then they do their own analysis of the president's budget. And they don't, always, they don't always agree. They don't always agree, but they get the point and they cost out the, the president's programs. And, you know, in retrospect, sometimes those things are accurate, and, uh, fairly accurate, and sometimes they're way off. A recent example is the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which had a lot of green energy subsidies. Whether that's a good or bad thing, we can argue about separately. But just in terms of the cost, the estimates now are three times what the original estimates were. They're well over a trillion dollars, and they're about $400 billion for those things. So there are many reasons for that, but um, that estimate proved to be wildly inaccurate and wildly uh, low. This causes a big problem because the Congress also sets rules uh, and has budget windows about what has to be done within that window, say a 10-year window. And therefore, they wind up kind of manipulating the various things they're doing to expire at a certain time or to start toward the end of the period so it doesn't really count very much because the first five or seven years there's very little and then it ramps up. So there's a lot of uh, game gamesmanship that goes on in that regard. And that's why, for better or for worse, people like me pour over it and try to explain that to the general public. Your sacrifice is greatly appreciated. Let's talk about what voters thought that they knew, especially by partisan ideology. How did they judge their own actual information about fiscal policy? Well, it varied a lot by topic, by overall fiscal policy and by topic. Uh, we asked about specific programs like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment insurance, the earned income tax credit, et cetera, et cetera, traditional welfare and so on. And they graded themselves, I think, uh, reasonably uh, responsibly in the sense that many admitted that they didn't know enough. Uh, some said, depending on the program from, you know, I think it was 17 percent uh, to high 20s, thought they knew enough or a lot. And uh, many said they didn't know much. And uh, also many admitted in subsequent questions in the cert that there were two surveys that they needed to know more. Do they need to know more? I mean, is it okay that a fifth of the American public thinks, yeah, I know enough and the rest don't care? Well, I think it would be a bigger problem if that number was much higher and there was a lot of misinformation and, uh, and not an appreciation that it might be useful to them to know more. And that's what I found encouraging about the survey was less that some people thought they knew a lot and some sizable fraction of them do, but not all of them. And some, some what they think they know is wrong. Um, but that many people were open to the idea that uh, it would be valuable for them to learn more about some fact-based information about these programs so they could be informed. All right. So how do they judge the knowledge of other American voters? Well, they also have a uh, – dim is too harsh a term perhaps. They also have a view that most other people don't know very much about these things. Some They think some are misinformed. Many don't know very much. Uh, and uh, – not wildly different from the, f the percentage that think they know, they know a lot or are well-informed. They think the rest of the public similarly, but it's a minority. It's a small minority. That being said, um, you know, it varies by program. 
And uh, so, for example, everybody, the, the, the program that came out for better force on top in the sense that people thought they needed to know more about it <laughs> was the tax code and tax policy. And, you know, short, right behind that was national security and the defense budget. Uh, and then there were things like um, inflation and government spending, deficits and debt, K-12 through education, elections and election law. And it kept going down. But even the thing at the bottom of the list, which in, this, in these surveys was climate, not that people didn't care about it, but that um, I think people on – the more partisan people on both sides think they know everything they need to know. Um, that probably is not accurate, but that's another story. But there was still a big chunk, 38 percent I think it was, that thought they needed to know more. And so even if it's two-fifths of the population that thinks they need to know more and up to you know, over, well over three-fifths of the population, that suggests that providing that information in a reliable way might be very valuable to an important part of uh, the voting public, an important part of people trying to make sense out of public policy. So you ran the Boskin Commission report in the 1990s about inflation and how much inflation was actually occurring. And that's a really big issue for today's voters. So I'd love to know what effects do official statistics, like how much inflation there actually is, have on voters' knowledge about attitudes toward public policy? Well, I think they uh, there are a source of information. But for most people, I think they see what's rea- the reality of what they're experiencing. We see a big set, a big disconnect right now, for example, between the macroeconomic data saying the economy is okay, it's slowed in the first quarter, or keep our fingers crossed it doesn't slow more, and that unemployment's still relatively low, although tick- ticking up a little bit, and that jobs are still being created, although k- ticking down a little bit. But the public has a much more sour mood in evaluation. And if you look below the headline numbers, you see some cause for concern. But these aren't trumpeted very much. For example, um, uh, on, the, on the, in the household survey the Bureau of Labor Statistics conducts, we see that there are a lot more part-time jobs and a lot more multiple job holders. And some of that, we can't tell exactly why that's the case, but it looks like some of that is caused by people being very stretched by the high inflation they've experienced the last several years. And that's number one. And number two are having to supplement their income and stretch themselves in order to not have a big reduction in their standard of living. You know, it's also important to know that people's perceptions sometimes lag a little bit behind reality, but I'd say most people, when the things they're hearing about are fairly consistent with what they're experiencing in their life, um, you might think of that as uh, when their intellect is telling them the same thing as their gut is telling them, that that is pretty reaffirming and they tend to believe that. But if they're experiencing some pain, there's also a language barrier that sometimes exists there's some techno speak that goes on. Oh, you don't mean English, Spanish. You mean English and economics or English and statistics. Uh, well, something like that. Something like that. So inflation is the rate of increase of prices. So if prices t- last year uh, to this year went up 5% to use a round number, that's a 5% inflation. If they go up 3% in the coming year, that's another 3% of inflation. It's disinflation, but uh, people tend to focus on the price level, especially when we've had high inflation for the first time since the early 1980s. What does that mean? That means nobody in the United States and many other countries below the age of 60 has ever experiencing, experienced high inflation in their work life as a business manager, as an investor, as a household budgeter. They haven't experienced anything like that. So the cumulative effect, even though it's correct that inflation is lessening, it ticked up a tiny bit last month and hopefully will continue its path toward the Federal Reserve's goal of 2%, which, as the Boskin Commission indicated, is probably closer to 1% in reality because of measurement issues. But that's that's another issue. But the point is that people have their own perceptions. And people will sometimes say – you know, inflation's high when they mean it's cumulated for the last two or three years to something high, even though contemporaneously over the last three months or last year, it's, it's lower, but it's still, uh, prices are still rising. Another example is recession. The technical meaning of it, it's measured in various ways and dated in various ways, is when the economy falls into a hole, it's out of recession as it starts climbing out. 
Uh, now, if you're in a deep hole, it may take you a long time to climb out. And to th the average person, understandably, the recession's over when things are back to being pretty good. Right. And that may, that may be, you know, many quarters or years after we start climbing out of the deep hole. Big picture, how do you actually change people's minds? You have these surveys that say American voters know a little bit or many don't know that much. So how do you actually engage with them? Well, that's a deep question that I'm not fully prepared to answer, but in, in my humble opinion and observation over time, it's trying to get them information in a way they can absorb and relate to and, and believe is trustworthy. That may or may not be sufficient, but I believe it's necessary. And so that's an important first step. And important to do that is to get it to something that's easy for them to digest, easy for them to understand, which is why in the Tannenbaum program, as we're taking this great work people are doing and condensing it down, and we're continuing to condense it down, and we're, we'll, we're doing these shorter videos, and we're doing um, and we're do, going to be doing a just the facts kind of simple thing for uh, here's the basic facts about energy, for example. Did you know how much energy is really produced and consumed in the United States? Do you know where it comes from? Do you know how much wind and solar account for versus natural gas and oil or coal, et cetera? Do you know what, uh, you know, many other facts about it? Do you, know, do you know what's actually gone on with climate and what's agreed to and what's debatable and why? So... Uh, there's a big part of the population that can benefit from it. Not everybody will take advantage of it, but we have to get it out there to enough people and, in a way that they can rely on and continue to rely on and trust and relate that to their daily lives in various ways so they can experience that. You know, I tend to, when I write for the general public uh, in my column or something like that, I try to have kind of the economic uh, analysis, the specifics for a typical family or something like that, a household, and a couple of examples. And as you go from the general, which may be important to get across to a segment of the population, you'll hit a lot more people if they understand it in a way that they can relate to. In much the same way that people say that, you know, the, the thing, a picture's worth a thousand words, or, you know, the, the, you know, they read the first two or three paragraphs and don't have time to read much beyond that. So our, our big challenge now, and we're in the process of doing that, is funneling it down to something that is really easy to digest for a much larger fraction of the population. You already mentioned energy. Can you give me a preview of the other issues that the Tenenbaum program is looking into? Well, we have a wide swath, but the early ones that are commissioned, which are about to come online, the first one will be on election laws and election integrity and access. We have some great people who have studied that people who have been Republican lawyers and people who have been Democratic po political operatives, et cetera. And they agree on a variety of things, and this is going to remain contentious, and we will publish the information. Uh, soon after that, we'll be on energy and climate. We have four great people from a range of perspectives by discipline and by, uh, and by perhaps politics a little bit in the sense of the priority they take on rapidly making a transition and pay less attention to the cost versus people who pay more attention to the cost, et cetera. And then we'll be doing uh, taxes and the tax code and deficits and debt and inflation and growth and schools. And then we're in the process of, we're in addition to these, these surveys we've talked about, we're doing supportive surveys. We have one that we're going out to the public with soon on taxes that will be usable by the people, in this case, Jason Furman and Kevin Hassett, one who served as Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, President Obama, one for President Trump. They'll be useful to them, and we'll incorporate that in the materials we distribute. Michael, thank you for laying out the agenda for us. I'm looking forward to going through it. Well, we are too. We're very excited about this program, Tom, and we're very hopeful that a, a fairly large number of people will be able to benefit from it. That's the whole purpose, and we're, we're anxious to keep going. If you'd like to see more from the Tenenbaum Program for Fact-Based Policy, you can go to hoover.org slash Tenenbaum. If you'd like to see more from Michael Boskin, you can go to www.michaelboskin.com. That'll pull up his research and recent op-eds. If you'd like to follow me, you can do that at Twitter, at Tom V. Church. And you should follow the Hoover Institution page at Hoover Inst. That's I-N-S-T. If you have any questions that we didn't cover today that you'd like to see answered, send them in, and we will get to them in a future show. And look in the description for a link to the show notes where I'll post links, references, anything else we covered today. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time.